This is Don Rowan in Aura Paul at uh, Norwich University, and we're doing uh, the economic diversity and the build environment, and it's a panel discussion with a number of experts. They're going to be discussing this for the next hour, and so we're lucky to uh, hope that you'll join us and enjoy the show. Oh, you skipped your, your, your face. Yeah. Yeah, that was just that. <laughs> the only version of my face that any of you need is this one right here. You're going to have, I mean, in fact, I don't recommend looking at it. I recommend looking at the slides. I, my, my, sorry, my photography is better than my, my personal beauty. Um, does this work? Um, thank you all. Uh, it's a real honor to be here and, and to be on this esteemed panel. Um, I'm going to do my best to, uh, to make four hopefully relatively brief points um, and to try to in some ways incorporate, I think, a few uh, points and lessons to piggyback on my four esteemed uh, colleagues. Um, so yeah, my name is Alex Schaffer and I'm, the, I'm probably the least practically useful of the, of the panelists, um, unfortunately, so uh, but hopefully... Uh, I will, I will have some things uh, that, that are useful to say. Um, and, and because I, I read too much BuzzFeed, I, I've made four points. So there's a listicle for, for all of you young generation who like the listicle, this is a listicle. So um, the first point is if we're going to talk about uh, economic diversity in the built environment in the United States of America, then that can't just be a question about class. It has to incorporate race at the foundational level. There isn't, you know, if you're looking at the country as a whole with very few exceptions, class and race are so intertwined in this country that, it, that it's just, you know, my apologies, and I recognize that it's changed. It's not the way that it once was, but race is, for, you know, currently and for the foreseeable future, an integral part of this conversation. So it's, race can be an even more difficult conversation to have in the United States than class, but it's one that absolutely has to happen. But in order to have that conversation, and I think to do it well, and especially to think about the, the relation between race, class, and the built environment, we need to do a little bit of what Sarah asked, which is to sort of broaden our, I think, the geographic frame of reference. I wrote it down. So we're going to enlarge our geographic frame of reference. So one of the main ways that we think about uh, race and class and the built environment in the United States is through the lens of segregation. And, and Gina mentioned a lot of the kind of key tools like redlining that were used to segregate uh, the American metropolis. So one of the biggest challenges, though, is that segregation isn't still around in the United States. And many of the places that were the kind of key geographies, the key areas of segregation, still feel the impacts on a day-to-day -day basis of the, all of the things that happened 50, even 100 years ago. But at the same time, segregation has changed. Suburbia is not what suburbia once was. The geography of our metropolis has just gotten so much bigger. So many people of color have moved out of older inner city neighborhoods looking for the American dream, looking for housing, moving very far away. So if you really want to understand segregation in most metropolises in the United States, you need to get in your car from wherever you feel like segregation happened in the center city and drive for an hour in any in a variety of different directions and then you will see start to see the larger metropolis communities of color have been moving out to suburbs for a very long time in the united states and just because there's a new geography doesn't mean that people are still segregating so this is the what i talk about is resegregation so the the book you see here um there's actually a 30% discount voucher on my website, but Barbara's book is probably cheaper and better than mine, so it all comes out in the watch. So this is a big argument that I make um, about the San Francisco Bay Area. So this is a, a, a dot density map that you'll see of what segregation looked like in the 1970s. An African-American community is represented in, in the, the yellow dots. And you can see that there's just really intense clustering. If you were African-American in the San Francisco Bay Area in 1970, there were a handful of neighborhoods in the entire region of many millions of people in which you could rest your head at night. <clears throat> and this formed what I like to think of as a, a mental map. And you can see some of the spaces right here. This is East Oakland and West Oakland. This is the small industrial city of Richmond. There's a handful of neighborhoods in San Francisco. 
there's a kind of forgotten about places in suburbia. Again, there's a myth of kind of segregation as always being a urban, a central city thing, when in fact there are always been important African American and other communities of color in suburban spaces, often attached to industry. So this is East Palo Alto here, not too far from Silicon Valley. There's some places out in Stockton, out in here. And this is a pretty big distance. So from this city of Stockton out to San Francisco, uh, it's about 75 miles um, and about two hours in traffic. So this um, creates a kind of mental map of what we think about segregation as something being trapped. So this is a, a set of mental maps that were done in Los Angeles in 1970. And so the map on the left is a composite of uh, middle class white folks from the San Fernando Valley about what was their city, what was their region, where did they go, where did they work, where did they, where was their space. The map on the right is a composite map of Latino families in Boyle Heights in East LA. And you can see again a much smaller space that felt like, you know, these were the spaces that felt like they were their spaces. And so this has given us an understanding of segregation, of what I like to think of as ghettoized segregation, that was about being trapped. You, you physically at the threat of violence, for cultural reasons, legal reasons, all sorts of reasons, if you were a person of color during this era, just simply couldn't leave. It was dangerous at times, not even just to try to live in a place, but even to sort of circulate in these spaces. So, but things have changed in a lot of ways. So this is a, a simple map, a graph. Um, I'm not much of a data guy, but every once in a while you come across a map that really, a graph that really says something. So the line in red is the African American population of the city of, of the county of San Francisco, and the city and the county of San Francisco are the same. And the, the line below is the African American population of San Joaquin County, which is out here in the east. And so you can see San Francisco has gone from an African American population about 14% at its height to less than 3% now. And the population of San Joaquin County, there are now more African Americans in San Joaquin County than there are in San Francisco County. Um, I can show you another map in here. So these, in, if you look at this map, these communities out in, in this area, in southern Solano County and eastern Cuatrocaso County in the Bay Area, now have collectively more African American residents than all of Richmond and Oakland, right? Than Richmond, and when, which were the heart of the black community in the Bay Area at the time. And so I could talk about the Filipino community in the same way. I could talk about Southeast Asians from Cambodia and Vietnam, from Laos, from Hmong refugees who came after the war. We could talk about Latinos in a similar way. Again, different geographies, but this same process of migrating out from central city locations to suburban places for a whole slew of different reasons. Sometimes because the neighborhoods are gentrifying. Sometimes because people are being evicted. Sometimes it's because it's an opportunity to buy a house. And people want to buy a house. They want peace and quiet, a home with a swimming pool. It's the American dream. I mean, simply because people are moving to suburbs isn't unusual or weird. Why I call it resegregation is that this map that you see is a map of foreclosures. And so if you want to find the foreclosures, the San Francisco, California, the Bay Area, which is a region in total about, this region that you're seeing is about nine or 10 million people, right? We are the richest metropolis in the United States of America. You can make an argument that the San Francisco Bay Area is the richest region in the world and perhaps the richest region in history. And we we're also famously very progressive, supposedly. So, but we were one of the centers of the 2008 foreclosure crisis. And almost all of the foreclosures happened not in San Francisco or in Oakland or in center cities, but far deep in these suburbs that many people in San Francisco have never been to, right? Places that are 50 miles away, 75 miles away. Where all of these communities that you see that are highlighted with the highest foreclosure rates, all of these communities are majority non-white. We're talking about cities between 50 and 150, 200,000 people. This is the city of Stockton, right? So we're talking about people who have moved out to suburbs facing high rates of foreclosure. With foreclosure came fiscal crisis, right? The property taxes that we pay in most places, in places like California, pay for schools and roads and sewers and parks, right? The largest municipal bankruptcy in the history of the United States was the city of Vallejo until the city of Stockton, which is larger, went bankrupt a couple years later. So in all of these places, communities of color now have seen, again, it's not the same type of being trapped segregation that we, that we saw, but you're still dealing with very unequal suburbia. So it's not about suburbs versus cities, but about 
different experiences in different types of suburbia. If you go into the inner ring suburbs in the Bay Area, these places right here that I'm talking about in the center, where I grew up here in Marin County, here is where all your computers come from, right? These places saw, have the opposite experience. So in Palo Alto, home of Stanford University, right on the edge of Silicon Valley, had a, a foreclosure rate of five foreclosures for every 100,000 people. Patterson, right, which went from a city of about 1,000 people in an old farm town to a city of about 25,000 people, again, majority non-white, 5,000 foreclosures for every 100,000 people. That's 1,000 times difference. And so what we essentially is we went from creating a, a, a region which had inequality based on city versus suburb, we now have a situation where we have unequal suburbia. That when it was finally time for people of color to have the opportunity for the suburban dream, that suburban dream was not provided at the same level and the same quality and the same degree of security that it was provided to my parents. So the class trajectory that my family went through, you know, father grew up in New York City, again, in, in, you know, the grandchildren of immigrants moving through this American class hierarchy, as you know, Jews became white and moved to the suburb and we had all of those privileges. Well, when the suburban door was open to communities of color, the same quality of suburbia was not there. And there's a whole set of reasons why it's not there. But the point I wanna make here is that again, you've gotta think about race and you've gotta alter your geography. The geography of the American metropolis is not the same as it was. Now, but this is the problem, this is the challenge, right, in understanding this is that just because suburbia is now really has changed and segregation hasn't changed, it doesn't mean that old fashioned forms of segregation are gone. You need to think about things with a both and attitude. Either or is a very kind of 20th century way of thinking, but since you're all like, some of you are even born in this millennia, which is terrifying, or maybe almost, right? Anybody born in 2000 in the room? Oh my God. <laughs> so again, Old-fashioned segregation, your grandparents' version or your great-grandparents' version of segregation still exists in many places in the United States at the same time as this new 21st first century kind of what I think of as mobile segregation. Right? I call it resegregation for various political reasons, but you could also think about it as two point, segregation 2.0 or a new form of segregation. Right? So that's the first point that I want to make. The second point, uh, which I think builds really well on a lot of people's uh, perspective, is, is that I want you to think that at the core, it's not just about code or about policies, it's gotta be about the politics. If you want, mo what most of my book is about is not actually about resegregation, it's about how in the richest and supposedly most progressive place in the United States that we allowed this to happen. We knew 50 years ago that this process was beginning. We had lots of good plans, lots of good planners, tons of good designs, and just at the end of the day, couldn't get it together to make it happen. And when I talk about politics, I'm not just talking about you know, red versus blue, Democrats and Republicans. I'm not just talking about what presidents do or Congress people or local government officials or even people who work for the government. I'm talking about the full set of politics. Right? All of those coalitions, all of those power dynamics, all of those sets of relations. I'm talking about neighbor on neighbor politics, right? The way that you as an individual relate to your homeless neighbor is politics. That's not just humans on humans, that forms politics. Right? It can be as simple as like relationship with global corporations like Subway, which has, I looked it up, 25,000 stores, 22,000 stores in 111 countries. And I've been to, I think, more than my share. <laughs> right? So you need to think about that broader politics. Because again, we always have lots of really good ideas, but to get to the point where you can either upscale them, where, you can, where, where subsidies are being pushed in one way or another, where things become possible, is because of politics, not just because of the types of code. Um, again, what in, in, in the book, one of the big things that I argue about is that essentially we weren't able to pull together the, the type of effective politics that we need. Uh, and so this is one of the things that I want to encourage people to think about is, is, is there a somewhat of a different way of thinking about different types of politics? At the end of the day, Housing is something that we collectively produce that everybody needs, or perhaps shelter. I really appreciate the kind of thinking about shelter and not just about housing. Um, but I think we could, we could come to a consensus in this room about the need for housing. We may disagree vehemently about how to build it, or you might want one kind of house and you might want another kind of house. But we need to start thinking about the fact that at the end of the day, right, the politics of housing are about coming to an agreement. 
Other issues in our society, like war or abortion, are not about coming to an agreement. They're about drawing lines in the sand, and you be on one side and I'm, I'm on the other. And we're not trying to come up with a, a, a reasonable solution or effective politics. It's about holding the line. But in housing, again, we have such a dysfunctional housing system, despite the fact that almost everybody needs or wants a house. Um, and so again, I include all sorts of actors. You know, again, people like banks, right? Almost all of you are gonna go work for firms. You're gonna be playing the game of housing and design, and that broader politics really matters. The second, a third point, uh, which relates to the second, third, first point, and, uh, and again, I think plays a lot off uh, what, what Dave showed, is to go beyond kind of models of good housing. Because what, what makes good housing for me is not what makes good housing for you. Um, one of the biggest problems with you know, various other eras of housing is that we always had this kind of one size fits all. I mean, I love the spirit of the modernist era of really trying to build mass housing for the masses, but there were so many sort of sins by architects and other and planners and designers assuming that there was one type of housing for different people. So the goal is, for me, is again, to be not, it's not, it's a, not about deciding which of those models is better and being a lot less judgmental and trying to figure out ways to make all, as many forms of housing secure, right, about reducing vulnerabilities, about reducing risk, regardless of the type, tenure type or the design type or the location. And so let me give you an example, right? So one of the things that we've, we used to think that, for instance, homeownership was better because homeownership was more secure. In 2000, between 2007 and 2010, 10 million homes in the United States were foreclosed. There's only about 130 million housing units or something like that in the United States, maybe 150 now or something maximum. So we're talking about, I don't know, somewhere between five and eight percent of all the, you know, of all the structures, let alone all the owned structures. Right? So there is no sort of inherently secure form of tenure. Any type of house can burn down, can be knocked down. You can be dispossessed of any type of home in, in the United States, whether it's foreclosure or eviction or code violations or natural disaster or fire. You can always, they're always in security, and we need to be start paying attention to finding ways of securing everything, and not simply about finding this sort of ideal form of tenure. And that includes also kind of some of the urban-rural divides. I mean, one of the big political problems we have in the United States is that people assume that there's no sort of shared political interest between people who live in different lifestyles, that somehow I live in rural Vermont and I want to live a particular way versus I live in Boston or New York or in the big city and some, but no, everybody lives in some sort of home and there's some basic understandings. There's ways that we can create, I think, a better politics around reducing uh, vulnerability. And so this is one of the things that I've been working on with some colleagues in Oakland, um, is trying to develop a new form of public policy analysis around housing vulnerability. Uh, we, we cons most of the analysis we do in the state of California around housing has to do with needs assessment. We try to figure out how many different types of houses of different income levels we need to build and then we never build them, right? And one of the reasons why we never build them is that everybody is scared. Renters are scared, homeless people are scared, homeowners are scared, big landlords, everybody is nervous that they're gonna lose their thing. And so nobody can pull together to really be able to produce the new type of housing. Because at the end of the day, try to convince somebody that the new house building being built on the corner is gonna somehow benefit you, you already have a home. So housing vulnerability analysis, we did a pilot study in Oakland, you can go to housingvulnerability.org and start to see the contours of what we're developing. It's trying to figure out a way that we can Start paying attention to vulnerability. How do we protect people and preserve existing housing in part so that we can produce a new politics that's capable of upscaling the types of production? Whether, again, it's the big scale interventions that Gina works on, whether it's some of the small scale interventions uh, that you're seeing from, from the other two folks. Um, and as one final point, um, I do want to say that one of the ways of building this kind of new politics involves a certain degree of restorative justice. Um, now, this, this map, this picture you see, um, I saw Seat Pleasant. So, so th th this is about Kevin Durant and, and the Golden State Warriors. Uh, this is a picture in Oak, taken in Oakland. Now, in my opinion, the Golden State Warriors do not owe anybody an apology for being so good. Sorry if there's Celtics fans or whatever else y'all, you know. Uh, but the Golden State Warriors actually do owe the city of Oakland an apology for the way that they have left the city and, and just, again, not for act of leaving, but for the way of doing it, right? This is taken on a BART platform where Oscar Grant was killed in 2009, uh, right? So BART as an agency, this is the Bay Area Rapid Transit System, does owe a certain amount of apologies. So one of the problems we have, I think, of creating a new politics is that so many of the institutions that we're part of, whether it's, you know, again, not this university, but other universities that I've been part of, whether it's institutions like architecture or planning, 
right? Whether it's public agencies, whether it's big developers or banks, so much so people's lack of faith in the politics of urbanization and housing and development comes from the fact that we've watched all of this injustice happen for such a long period of time, and so nobody trusts anybody. Nobody trusts that like at the end of the day you're not gonna get done because we've made a lot of promises. Architecture, planning, development, we've made a lot of promises to a lot of people over a long period of time and at the end of the day haven't been able to produce. And I do think that there's gonna have to be a certain kind of acknowledgement of that history. Right? Again, Gina mentioned give you that long history. People know their history, they're not stupid. People didn't wake up yesterday and so everybody's gonna be, oh yeah, this is all wonderful, let's all band together. In order to get some of that new politics, I think there's gonna have to be some restorative justice, some act of just acknowledging, hey yeah, listen, you know, we screwed up. As a planner, as an academic, I can raise my hand. As a white suburbanite, I can raise my hand. I can acknowledge all of the ways that the communities either, you know, not necessarily me, I wasn't even alive when a lot of this was done. I can still own that history, and I think that's going to be really important. He's got to build some new faith in that new type of politics. I think that means us, brings us to the end. But the, the first question um, is for everyone. But Alex, you um, you brought up the point that um, we're such an affluent society. We're, uh, the United Nations um, ranks the U.S. in the top 15 wealthiest nations in the world, and our economic model is based on growth, and in in particular um, growth of affluence. So it. it is, does that model work to solve these problems ultimately? Or do we need a new model to solve some of these issues? Softball. Um. <laughs> I'm gonna do the classic move and like twist the question around. Um, so my answer to this would be, um, I'm not really a believer that we actually have a model. So there's not a model, there's just that you know, the economy is a very complex thing. And I think the most important thing that we need to do is to stop talking about the economy as if it's some sort of one big thing. Mm -hmm. There are economies. So the economy of housing is not the same as the economy of energy, which is not the same as the economy of food, right? So I'm a hardcore capitalist when it comes to the economy of beer. I think <laughs> beer has been, Beer is the only functional economy we have in America. I don't think there's a single person in this room who doesn't have access to beer. Uh, all the beer that they can need, it comes at the right price, in the right location. We have an immense amount of innovation. We have massive global beer corporations and all sorts of small microbrew corporations and they all function well. You have certain degrees of government oversight in the right way, in the right place, whether it's purity, whether it's sale to minors, public spaces. Alcoholism and support, you have nonprofit sector involved, everybody, again, it's a whole massive specific economy. So I'm told, I think the beer economy is working really well and the housing economy really sucks. <laughs> and so the key for me in some ways is to, if you talk about growth versus degrowth or, or you use the C word, capitalism, and you talk about whatever other variations that are kind of come, you immediately get into these kind of political ideological fights that have cursed the 19th and 20th century. So what I believe, what I, what I would argue for is to start talking about the economy of specific things. Because each, you know, set, it's not just an industry, right? We also, we have to talk, you know, housing is not an industry. Yes, it, it is an industry, but it is a much bigger economy that involves 
social connections to how that people have, emotional connections, cultural relationships to housing. We can talk about that within the larger economy. So we need to start separating it out. Some of our economies need to grow. Our housing economy does need to grow. Other, other aspects of our economy probably could stand to shrink. Right? Some of them we need to focus on just kind of keeping them stable. But the key, I think, is, and, and, and this is really important, I don't think we've done enough in the world of the built environment, is to insist that the, the economies of the built environment are different. And they can't just be reduced to the larger economy. So I hope that's not too much of a punt and redirection. Uh, it, seems, it seems like part of the, the question is maybe does capitalism work? I mean, that's, you know, capitalism is about growth. You've got to keep growing and keep making more money. And I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with that, except for the way we work now is these externalities are not paid for. So we're using environmental resources that everybody's suffering for them being used and money being made off them, but we're not getting paid back for those things that we're losing. Uh, and I, you know, my my point of the, of the final slide about how it's so easy to take care of people's minimal needs um, and how much we're losing at the top of that pyramid for what we can get back from those people. I mean, that's growth at the top of the pyramid that we, that we can get back that we're losing because we're uh, we're not paying for the externality of just disposing of these humans. Um, so I don't think it's necessarily that growth is the problem, but I think that externalities perhaps are the problem, that we're getting things for free and we're disposing of things that we're not paying for. Um, so I'm, I'm a big supporter of a minimum uh, income, uh, minimum survival income, and I kind of wonder what a, a capitalist system would do with all the skills of, of people like this um, to provide housing and security for people if uh, you know, society was required to make sure everybody was housed and was safe, I think that we could make this stuff happen pretty easily. Because um, the skills are here, it's definitely worth it. So. I want everybody to answer the question. Can you say the question again? <laughs> well, just as a, um, uh, as such an affluent uh, society, such an affluent country, our economic model is based on growth and, uh, and affluent, and growing affluence. So is, that, does that model still work to solve some of these issues? Is there another model? Yeah, I think that that's a really hard question. Uh, for me, it's hard to separate uh, affluence uh, from race. And so, you know, if you're talking about affluence and, and people that have affluence uh, helping, uh, say, underserved neighborhoods uh, to grow, um, that's usually in the hands of one race uh, versus uh, and or one class, right? So if you have lots of brown people um, and people of lesser means, you know, what they think about every day is not necessarily about, you know, how I can use my money to, say, better society. Um, they're thinking about, you know, how, right, how can I pay the rent? You know, how can I buy groceries for my family? Um, I think that um, folks who uh, live in these uh, underserved communities, the, the youth are probably thinking, you know, how can I use my money to buy the things or to be affluent, right? I, you know, I want the, you know, the shoes and the sneakers and the jewelry and all of that. And so, you know, certainly talking about affluence and and a model for um, improving uh, the community. That's that's just a hard thing for me to even think about how to separate those two. You know, for for and I'll say one more thing. It, it's interesting being um, having some affluence and being African American uh, because you still have the same exact challenges, right? Um, in terms of access to opportunity. Um, in terms of pe people's preconceived notions about who you are or you know how you live, um, I wind up a lot having people think certain things of me, uh, but because of my skin color and you know nothing else about my background. So um, that's sort of, that's part of why I'm, I'm in this space in terms of community development work. Um, I'm using my affluence. Um, 
to help people who don't have uh, as much as I do. And so, you know, helping and working in communities and um, providing support to people and letting them know that just because you're brown doesn't mean you can't do it. Um, I use that. Sure, I'll try. And Sarah, I want to hear your thoughts on this too. Um, I'll just add that I think the, you know, that we, we sort of talk collectively in this country as if there's a trust in the market, um, but the market has never operated um, as, a, as a shared thing that everyone has equal access to. And so we can't act like, okay, well today we're gonna start, you know, um, we're gonna start doing this right. And like it's, it doesn't get to start today. And so that's part of our challenge is that we've got, um, you know, I think our, all of our presentations touched on this on some level, but there's, you know, um, there are these, uh, uh, I, really, I really do think that reparations is a conversation we need to be having very explicitly. Um, uh, in um, you know at universities we're doing this at UVA but also um, you know uh, but also in our urban planning and in our cities like how how do we reflect on uh, on the the game never being fair and never being equal for so long um, and uh, and then also uh, you know how do we make better choices today so I've been our school is going through a racial equity auditing process because there's so many structural inequities that aren't even just in like the money, but are actually in, you know, to Gina's point, like uh, people are hired left if they have non-Anglo sounding names and people, you know I mean? Like our, our racism is so embedded in every decision we make that the game is fixed. And, um, and so that's gonna continue to be a problem that's not only about the economy as a as a numeric thing, but actually also about like the way we make all of these choices as a collective um, that have very real economic effects. <laughs> Sarah, do you want to add anything? <laughs> Sorry. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't. Um, I, I love listening to you guys talk about this, uh, thinking about models and growth. Of course, then it makes me think about um, capitalism, which I appreciated Alex's um, derailing from, from go, you know, commenting straight on, on, on an opinion about capitalism. To me, one of the biggest risks of what people write about and talk about right now in terms of thinking about everything in a cost-benefit analysis or in terms of dollars or the kind of financial logic or so-called neoliberal movement that we're all living in um, is, is, is the deterioration on our imaginations to, to think about solutions, systems, alternatives outside of an economic framework. And I think that, to me, is one of the biggest risks of our moment and of this kind of um, the extent to which growth as as the the only means for survival for businesses, and then how that leaks into the fact that businesses are everywhere. Uh, another thing I researched that I didn't talk about today is prisons. I do I do research on immigrant detention centers, and immigrant detention centers are 80% privately owned. And if there's a growth model for a privately run detention prison, um, that is inherently a problem. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think this question of, of can we find solutions with the same system that we are, not that you're exactly asking that, but to rephrase or to imagine the question slightly differently, you know, can we find solutions to some of these problems with the same system that we currently have? I mean, to me, the answer is no, we can't. Um, and we have to, make sure we keep our imagination sharp and alive to figure out a, a, a different way to to uh, have solutions that make viable lives, to use that word that, that, uh, that Dave was, was uh, using for his, for his project, um, possible for more people. Mm -hmm. Love to open this conversation up to the wider public. Yes, Carl. Uh, thank you for these phenomenal presentations and there's a lot of really productive overlap too. Um, I actually want to pick up on what Sarah was just talking about, and this does connect to um, some of what Alex explored also. 
Uh, and I'm going to use the imagination sort of theme here. Uh, the questions of power and equity came up. Um, and frankly, I don't see how we can really get to the issue of uh, the proper and just and rational distribution of power if we don't confront capitalism. Uh, capitalism is uh, the mode that has enabled an intense concentration of global wealth, uh, which is itself a problem, but it also is a kind of stranded asset. I mean, we have so many challenges globally and we can't get at the assets because this is now held by capitalist entities uh, which exercise enormous power. So on the question of sort of the urban uh, development issue, um, couldn't we um, take Alex's invitation to kind of designate what's appropriate for capitalist expansion and what isn't and say that the city, for example, should be um, not the site for capitalist in uh, investment strategies um, because there's no security, there's no housing security as long as it is possible for massive development entities to create all kinds of mechanisms to alter housing, to shape housing for the wealthy, um, to make it a form of you know property ownership for the purpose of having extra assets. I mean, I think I heard something about New York now, Manhattan having 30%. Uh, non-occupancy, something like that. It's a high number. That can't be solved by the the kind of the grassroots, uh, you know, synthesizing of strategies and working together. That is a macro question. Um, so I'll sort of I think there is a place where the antagonism uh, between uh, what you know what I would call a, a decommodified socialist uh, platform and maybe some form of capitalism, which is pretty insistent. Uh, have to fight them, fight it, fight it out. <laughs> well, uh, it, it's it's hard for me to think about it on a macro level, but I have seen in cities, for example, where um, back to politics, where certain politicians decide that in order to develop. Uh, buildings, um, they look at two or three different issues. One is the rights, affordable housing component. I was talking earlier about inclusionary zoning, right, to make sure that um, in these developments where they're building high end and luxury apartments, that they also have to build apartments that are affordable. Um, some politicians will institute things like um, a certain number of units only a certain number of units can be allocated for investment so that investors that, again, build these high-end apartments um, aren't allowed, or condos, uh, aren't allowed to only sell them off to investors so that they're not real occupants or people who really live in that city and pay taxes to that city and work in that city. Um, so there are ways that at least some politicians on a local level and a state level decide they're going to try to influence capitalism by putting in you know, various rules and regulations to sort of help solve that problem. Um, I think you know, if we're thinking about it on a, on a macro level and having to go up a level higher in terms of versus cities versus states versus the federal government, I mean, maybe that's where you deal with it on a, on a macro level, but obviously we're not in a position to do that now when we have billionaires right running the federal government. I do think there's an interesting push towards uh, community benefit agreement models, um, not just at the, at the sort of traditional level that they've been done for the last decade, but, but actually, um, especially as we're in a school of architecture, a push towards models that are um, that are thinking about public infrastructure differently. So like the founders of the High Line um, in, uh, in New York have, have come out publicly to say, we really wish we'd asked the question first, what do our neighbors need? Um, and really structured our, our plan based on that, which would have been a very different plan. I, I think it probably still would have been a really pretty park, but, um, but thinking about the investments and the policies and the politics around the High Line would have been 
fundamentally different if we were answering your question uh, with that in mind. And that, so the 11th Street Bridge Project uh, Park in, um, in DC is a really interesting model where they have said, all right, we want to take that. We want to repurpose this piece of you know uh, sort of non-functional infrastructure and make it into a park. But we know that the way that these things play out is that a lot of people in the Anacostia neighborhood will be displaced, and we cannot have that ethically. So instead, we're going to raise fifty million dollars to to start a fund um, to, for, to make sure that people get to stay in their homes. We're going to do this in a community-driven way, um, and then you know only after we've really found the um, the models to kind of keep people um, you know having the amount of choice that they want in their own neighborhood to have the capacity to do what they want um, and and make their own and you know their own choices, then we can start raising money for this really pretty bridge. Um, and so you know I I think there are models out there that are starting to form. Uh, but um, but they're they're definitely still the exception and not the rule. So um, yeah, I would just offer probably two two points in relate, relationship to a, a great question. Again, I would I would push away from the use of the term capitalism, and the reason why for me is is that um, th this is just as much about. Uh, feudalism as it is about capitalism. I mean, if you look at the big cities right now, the major players are often sovereign wealth funds, you know, Singapore, Qatar, Dubai. Uh, it's inherited wealth, right? So it's, I mean, maybe it was capitalist when it was earned in the 19th century, but now, I mean, it's like, you know, daddy's money and grandpa's money and, you know, it's all about inherited wealth, which is a form of essentially feudal rule. Like you, you have it because you inherited it because your daddy had it or your grandma had it. And that's where the race, that's where the, if you want to look at the real racial inequality, you're talking about wealth, which is all about, uh, about who, you know, who's daddy. And, and again, speaking of, you know, yeah, the current situation in the White House is about someone who inherited land, land from his dad. Um, and so that, that's where the law of the development company comes from. And so again, again, the C word, this doesn't work because it doesn't get into, again, these old and inherited kind of very feudal relationships. The aristocracy in Europe basically fused with the capitalist class to become this kind of joint thing. So, so it just doesn't work as much. Again, I would much rather talk about greed. I would rather talk about power or elites. Uh, these to me are much more useful categories than imagining an economic system, which again, I don't think describes that much. And part of that has to do with the fact that again, uh, beer is not housing. They're really different systems, and we need to start talking about things in really different ways. And that's so. If you're starting to talk about how to regulate this kind of growing feudal relationships between real, especially urban real estate, uh, and the, and the economic system that produces and owns housing, um, then it becomes again. I think there's you start to see how all of these complex different actors have to be involved, both in crafting the larger movement to make change. But also in the codes. I mean, it's easy to say, to look at, again, the, the big crisis of vacant homes. And another thing to then develop the types of regulations and policies that can deal with it. Because we have a big problem. We often sort of, we have a lot of baby and bathwater problems, right? We, we try to create policies to deal with one particular social problem. And we create all of these externalities on top of it. You know, Airbnb, for instance, can be a lifeline for a lot of low-income people who rent rooms in their houses as a way of keeping afloat, it can also be a massive source of exploitation. You have, you know, short-term rentals are a massive challenge. Airbnb as a corporation is a different challenge. They're not, they're related, but they're not the same. And so I think, again, when you start to get down into the specific economies and away from the, these kind of bigger ideological constructs around capitalism, I think actually the types of coalitions, the types of like fine-grained political solutions become possible. Um, or become more possible. Again, again, the other thing about it is, is that when you take on the weight of history, you realize that the situation we're dealing with is hundreds of years in the making. And to undo it is, you know, we are the Jews wandering in the desert right now. Like, maybe those kids, maybe y'all that born in 2000 will see the light, the, will, will be around to see this solution, but I don't plan on being on, I don't think I'm gonna be on the planet. I doubt any of us really are gonna be around when this solution uh, arises. And but. We've lost the ability as a society to have any sort of long-term vision uh, down the road. And maybe, again, maybe one of the things that is important about climate change as a discourse, that at least it's allowing us to sort of, people are starting to think a little bit more long-term. Mm -hmm. Again, I think the climate change discourse needs a lot of sort of racial justice inserted in it, but 
again, some of the new leaders that you're seeing come from these communities and are speaking in this way, so maybe we're starting to see that, that long-term vision. Sonia? Um, so, you in a housing environment where the need for affordable housing is high, should we prioritize building uh, large amounts of affordable housing at the lowest cost, or building affordable housing whose design truly benefits the community? Can I answer that one? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I think you can do both. Uh, the, the example that I showed, can I actually put that back on the screen if yeah. you don't mind? show you the nanny Helen so this building between this and this um, so this project when we first uh, started designing it we use actually an architect Torty Gallus um, partners they are a who you all might know from being architectural students um, they do work all over the world actually and they do a lot of high-end uh, uh, development. Uh, but they've been also in the affordable housing space for a long time. And when we started this project in particular, we said, you know, we want to design something that is affordable, uh, that has affordable materials, but that doesn't look like it. And so, again, when I show folks this picture, they actually think these, uh, like this gray, they think that is metal panels. Right? But that's cementitious, which is a lot less expensive right, than metal panels. And I actually had a, um, I had a contractor. Uh, I needed a, an estimate for a new building I was building. And I basically said, use this building as an example. The building cost came in uh, two and a half times what this building cost. Because visually, the architect designed in, or, or I'm sorry, the um, contractor uh, estimated metal panels and all kinds of expensive things. But this building did not cost what, what it could have cost if you used traditionally, you know, uh, uh, traditional materials that you would use in a high-end apartment building. So you can do both. You can uh, provide people with quality housing and, and, and have it be affordable. Like I said, there are people who live here actually that make no income, that make zero income, and in the affordable housing business, you also have a, a utility allowance. And so when you make zero income, this property actually winds up writing you a check. So when you pay your utilities for $70 and you make no income, uh, basically the property pays you $70 so you can pay your utilities. So it's possible. Um, I wanted to thank you all for, for your work and your commitment to different um, racial minorities and disadvantaged populations. Uh, I think the question that I'm interested in asking is how our education model can be more linked to learning how to design in a way that comes from these people because frankly it isn't for the most part what we learn. We learn and we work in a project that is ours and we make the decision. So. I'm wondering what thoughts you have on how that sort of um, authorship from the community can actually be brought into how uh, we're learning. I like your question. Yeah, we have a lot of nods here. We almost like we planted you. Right, right. Um, so I spend a lot of time teaching interdisciplinary um, applied classes. So they're they're typically three hour um, credit hours, but um, but often people wish they were more. So you know, it's a it's a practicum like studio ish sort of a thing, um, and uh, and we work in partnership with um, with community groups. Uh, so it um, I spend a lot of my uh, my time actually writing grants for these projects because as a um, I see my role at the university as a resource mobilizer. So I can spend some of my time writing a grant that actually pays my partners to come and, and uh, collaborate. We are working right now, um, and the, the university is considering um, an institute called the Equity Institute for the redress of inequity through community-engaged scholarship, which would allow this to have an infrastructure um, where knowledge, because uh, often like I am completely in charge, right? I'm, 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 in, I'm in charge not only of my students' experience, but also of my 
partnerships, you know, partners experience if I'm the one with the grant. Um, so even that is an imperfect system. Um, so, uh, so universities have been really bad at sharing power. It's not a thing we do well. Um, and research is often about like those with the credentials getting to know all the things and ask all the questions. Um, so it's not a simple thing, but I spend a lot of my time working with my students uh, to understand how we can all be better partners. And so that takes, um, we, do, we do some implicit bias training. We do, um, we link that with structural inequity because you can't sort of do one without the other. Um, we, uh, we, you know, acknowledge uh, sort of power, um, you know, distributions that are in unbalanced and try to take time to, to do that. We, we do listening sessions all on our own before we get with our partner so that we can be the best partners that we can be. Um, and then often the project doesn't look exactly like we thought it would, right? And so they, there's a lot of like giving up on um, the, the sort of traditional conception of beauty, um, which I think is another thing that's really hard for our fields to do, is to sort of acknowledge that actually maybe beauty is in the, um, the sort of shared power, beauty is in the feeling of, of co-ownership, right? Beauty is in the wealth redistribution. Um, and, uh, and that's not a, you know, that's, we're working on that as a field. Like we've got, we've got a ways to go. So I think there's a lot of kind of fundamental challenges. Um, but honestly, uh, it will change because students like yourself are asking these questions. And if I could sort of upscale this point really quickly. Um, I think the other thing that's really important that we don't do enough of uh, in the United States is just learn at a young age how anything in the built environment is actually made. Um, I mean, I don't know, I went to public school in California, maybe y'all are from Vermont and, and went to different public schools where you learn how housing is built or how sewage systems work or how the energy systems work or how the water systems work or the food systems, but I didn't. Right? You learn about Congress, you learn about the Constitution, you learn about the history, but you don't learn about anything outside. Look, or Walk outside, look around you, and ask if at any point in your education system you learn how anything that got there, how anything got made. And we just don't learn it. And then we have all these problems with the fact that the system is inequitable and doesn't work, but it's like we don't actually teach it. And so that to me is a huge part. Um, and I think a lot of it goes beyond, again, expertise. I think one of the biggest things you can do here is, you know, is there a way for the architecture school to to extend this sort of understanding of housing and developed environment out into the rest of the campus, out into the rest of the community, so that people around here understand where everything came from and how it all got there and how it's all built. Um, too much of it we have to learn on our own, we learn through our professions, right? We don't learn until we become professional or until we get elected to public office and then we all of a sudden are responsible for caring for it. Um, so that has to be, you know, again, to me, learning about the built environment is just as important as as math and reading and science and all of the subjects that we learn in school and there just needs to be a bigger emphasis on education. If you look at other societies that I think that are better at it, uh, they learn more as, you know, as kids about how everything gets made. I just wanted to offer one thing I learned from uh, working for a software company for a number of years is uh, the notion of agile development um, and scrum. You know, these are ways that software companies are working a lot these days where um, instead of doing what they call a waterfall process, which is basically figuring out the whole problem and the solution and taking years to figure out this complex solution, they start out really small, um, ask, ask their stakeholders what the problem is, um, create a really small solution and learn from that, and then iterate. And you're always iterating with the stakeholders. So I think, I, I just noticed that, that I think it's really applicable to the architectural uh, process. So uh, just just take a look. There's a lot of stuff on the web about agile development, and um, there's a book called Story Mapping, which is a really great exercise. And uh, I mean, it'd be great to run an architecture studio based on on that process. Sarah, do you know what comes? Well, I was going to think this is somewhat a follow up. Can you speak what? a little louder? Yes, you. as a follow up. What would you, I'm trying to think how to articulate this, but knowing that there are these young people here who will be going in in very junior positions and firms when they get out of school, what questions can they act, ask? What actions can they take at that point in their life before they have the power of leadership of a firm or, to, you know, or the financing you know, to, to uh, finance affordable housing? 
what can, what can they do as junior professionals? Mm -hmm. And what would you advise them? That's great. Sarah, did you hear that question? A little bit, but that's okay. I, I'll listen to the answers. Okay, well, let me tell you what it was, because I feel like you're going to have good things to say. So it was um, for all of the students that are going to graduate and go into the world um, before they are running firms and you know making decisions, uh, what questions can they ask to be a part of this change? Well, I mean, I, she, I think the, the question asker said it was a follow-up to what Alex was saying. I and I think in many ways, my answer would be his plea, um, which is the questions should be about the curiosity of, of the built environment, the curiosity of the landscapes around you, um, asking questions about how to learn about people's histories embedded in all the things you look at, um, how to talk to people that you might not normally talk to so that you can collect a wider set of stories about how those places are made. Um, so I think that's a place to start in terms of just, you know, a, a kind of emphasis or focus on a certain kind of built environment history. Can they have agency in a firm, do you think, in any way, and in, in yeah. change as yeah. a junior person? Yeah. So, um, so I've, I've been lucky to be a part of a thing called Design Futures, which is a student leadership forum, and I've been um, amazed as I watch uh, young people funded by their universities to come and be a part of a, a sort of collective of, um, of young people and the people doing this work that are, you know, working with them. Um, uh, to uh, you know, to to sort of ask hard questions about how design and, and social justice relate directly, um, and then they go and and they are uh, often the people that the firms want. So um, you know, they're they're easily getting jobs um, because they're feisty and they're not going to give up and they're hard workers and. Um, and uh, and and so I think a lot of the um, design field is is actually. Um, keen and aware that some of the uh, students that are most sort of socially and civically minded are also the students that they want to hire um, and and they're the ones doing uh, dynamic design build projects with partners they're the ones that have really you know um, impressive uh, like I was learning about your freedom by design work um, earlier you know I mean those experiences where you're actually a part of something and you're making change um, are are incredibly transformational and you learn things that you don't learn when you're you know just learning about the Constitution to go back to Alex's point um, so I, I think what's nice about that is that now that that's sort of a seen you know truth in in the hiring world um, it's giving our younger generations the platform to be heard and and actually to uh, to suggest change and these uh, these firms that are you know um, the the sort of larger the Gales and the Perkins and Wills and the you know the Genslers they want to be um, seen as the firms doing this sort of work um, and so they actually want to hear those voices and they want to give them platforms to 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 be um, uh, to be the drivers of those change because often. And, you know, us old fogies know that actually we don't know how to solve some of these problems and the way that we learned didn't give us those skills. And um, so I, I actually think there's a fair amount, if you want to be in that space, there's, there's like, you know, room and encouragement. Um, and we just have to keep um, also really working uh, to, you know, to educate those uh, in power to, to make the space too. I want to give all of you the opportunity to just talk about how we can be helping our youth to empower them to help deal with these issues. Well, in my work, um, I usually wind up working with the same one or two or three architectural firms. And I do that because they have the same mission uh, in terms of the work I do. And so there are many architectural firms out there that specialize, say, in luxury uh, housing. and the way they perform community engagement is very different than the architects I work with. So I, I would say two things. For young people, certainly if you're passionate about working in communities, um, you find a firm that is also mission driven and believes in what you believe in. But on the flip side, um, 
if you like to be a pain in the ass, <laughs> you could, at, but you still are mission driven, why not go work for those, one of those big high end luxury apartment developers and, um, and kick their butts and make them do the work the way the work should be done, right? Not, not ignoring the community, not just going and throwing up a 15 story building, but doing true in, in community engagement. So. And like the last question here, but, well, I just had a comment to add about the question that Professor Gorski posed, that I think there needs to be more communication between the generations of professionals and students, because there are so many students that are driven and passionate about what we're talking about now and things like sustainability, and there's people that are curious, and there's professionals out there that know so much about this, and I just think there needs to be more communication between people like this. and. Like, in February, I went to a conference about sustainability by energy uh, efficiency in Vermont, and there were, an, I had to apply for a scholarship to get a uh, admission fee covered, and there were 40 scholarships to be applied for. I saw about eight students there at the whole conference for the two days, mm -hmm. um, and I found out about the scholarship from an alumni that was a student here, um, and I just think that if there was more communication between professionals about that convention and students, there would have been a lot more people there. Okay, well I have a question. So do you uh, often have professionals come and speak in the classroom and like do case studies besides the symposium? Mm -hmm. Do you have that? Mm -hmm. Because I see that a lot at universities where you know, folks, professionals come in with case studies and you can talk about all of the issues and that, that opens up, up, up a lot of communication, right? To have people from different disciplines come in and talk to you. I think that way you stay engaged with a variety of professional networks. <coughs> Did you want to ask me? I mean, the, the only piece of advice that I would give you or say it's in this question is just don't need to be wary of getting advice from old folks like me is that a lot of us have spent way too long playing the game and just assume that this is the way the rule this you know this is the way the world works but that's just a lot of horse puppy right the game that you see out there was created by humans you know it didn't come down from on high like we we whatever it is the economy or the politics or the housing situation we made it and Every generation remakes it in some ways in their own way, and you have to sort of stop, you know, the economics, economics of something might not work, but they, they can be fixed, they can be changed. Economics is not, you know, Newtonian laws of physics. Yeah, you drop an apple, it'll kind of do the same thing every time, but how's the economics has changed every development you build, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. So that's kind of thing. Again, it's project by project, piece by piece. Um, and so, you know, as I see once said, don't hit the player, hit the game. You can fix the game is what has to be fixed. And I think that's one of the key things that you can do. And you can do it from a, a, an early time. Look at Alexander Ocasio Cortez, right? <laughs> but the, my last word, I guess, would be that it, it, it's all about experience. I mean, I, I, I love getting older and I feel like I'm finally at this comfort point where I feel like I know enough. And I also know that what I, that I don't know and I'm comfortable with that as well. Um, so I'm not going around being frustrated with the way things are and just you know trying to blaze a trail without any knowledge behind me. Um, so I just say get a lot of experiences. Uh, even if you get a bad message, you can question it. That's learning just as well as learning something from somebody who has a, a better idea. And, and it takes time. It'll take time to become creative and to be able to be nimble, just like playing a guitar. You can play a chord, but to be creative with that, um, take some experience. So uh, enjoy the process um, and experience a lot. Well, I, I wanna continue this conversation but move it out into the atrium where we have a beautiful reception, but I wanna thank this incredible 